Imagine for a second that the internet was a small sleepy town in a faraway remote island. Houses were just built and everyone was living peacefully. One day, from nowhere, a missile launches but just passes over the town and makes no serious destruction. The town is now in fear and anxiety. The town is not so safe, the residents realize. Maybe they should move. And just like that, chaos is stirred. Well, this is the story of the internet in 1988. The internet was still new and no one could fathom an attack. But from his college dorm, a young man was building a missile that would destroy people's faith in the system, setting a precedent for other hackers after him. This is the story of Robert Morris Toppin and how he committed the first digital crime known to man. Born in 1965 to Robert Morris and Ann Farlow Morris, Morris had a dad, Robert Morris Sr., who was really good with computers. He helped create important computer systems and later became an important scientist at the National Computer Security Center, which is now the National Security Agency. Because of his dad, Morris grew up being fascinated with computers, or maybe was it in his genes? Aside from that, the boy grew up like any other young boy from a loving family. He was raised in Millington, New Jersey, and went to the Peck School, but eventually graduated from Del Barton School in 1983. After high school, there was no doubt that he was an intelligent young boy and his ambitions and sights were set on something big. As a promising mind, a lot of reputable colleges recognized what he had to offer from his application and invited him to attend their school. So with a choice that most other boys his age do not get, Morris decided to accept the invitation of one of the most prestigious schools in the world, Harvard University. Competing with other great minds like his, he excelled there as well and even attended Cornell University for more school. It was at Cornell that Morris did something that would shake the foundations of the internet, which was relatively new at the time, and write his name on the sands of time. So as we mentioned before, around 1988, the internet was still new. Not everyone was on it or even understood how it worked. It was way too early for a cyber attack of any kind. But from seemingly nowhere, the Morris worm slithered in to cause havoc. And it was all because of the young mastermind Robert Toppin Morris, a 23-year-old computer whiz with ties to Harvard and Cornell University. He had taken his interest and passion for computers from his father who worked with the NSA as a computer scientist, but little did his parents know that soon enough, their son would commit a crime that would rock the world as they knew it. On a fateful evening in November 1988, Morris unleashed his creation onto the world. Having grown up surrounded by computers, he set out to design a program that could quietly spread across the internet. To mask his actions, he even hacked into an MIT computer from his terminal in Ithaca, New York, releasing the worm into the digital realm. And just like that, the Morris worm was created and sent on a mission. As dawn broke, thousands of computers nationwide found themselves ensnared by Morris's creation, a program that transferred from one terminal to another like a relentless virus. Government and university systems stumbled to a crawl, emails were delayed, the chaos ensued. Estimates by the US Government Accountability Office valued the damage caused by the Morris worm between $10 million and $100 million. In essence, this marked the debut of the Distributed Denial of Service, or DDoS, attack, a method of overwhelming a network with a torrent of internet traffic to disrupt normal operations. But this is the interesting fact. Unlike later internet threats that aim to destroy or encrypt files, the Morris worm, as horrible as it sounds, wasn't designed to do any form of damage. It did not have malicious intent. As a matter of fact, Morris simply designed it to cause panic and perhaps prove a point that the internet was not as safe as people thought it was. But even he did not foresee the extent of the spread of the worm. According to the FBI, some institutions wiped their systems and others disconnected from the internet for weeks. The Morris worm is often hailed as the pioneer of internet viruses, yet it's crucial to distinguish between viruses and worms. Unlike viruses that need external commands to run, worms operate independently. Morris exploited vulnerabilities in the Unix Send Mail program, weak passwords, and other gaps to infiltrate prestigious institutions and research centers. While impacting only 6,000 people may seem trivial today, the Morris worm caused a sensation, grabbing national headlines. For most, it was their first encounter with both malware and the internet. The magnitude of what happened wasn't entirely clear, but the fear and intrigue were palpable. 
Eugene Spafford, an assistant professor of computer science at Purdue, recalled a curious call from a Southern Indiana newspaper earnestly asking if readers should worry about catching the virus. With deadpan humor, Spafford replied, gosh, I don't know. We don't have a medical school. You ought to call the folks at Indiana University. It just went to show how clueless the vast majority of the public was about what was going on. At the end of the day, none of this chaos was part of Morris's initial plan. But aside from all these, what exactly is the Morris worm and how did it work? Good question. According to a friend of Morris, the creator of the worm, Morris essentially made the worm just to test if he could do it. That was it. He released it from MIT to make it seem like the creator studied there, not at Cornell. But according to another source, Clifford Stoll, who wrote The Cuckoo's Egg, there were rumors that Morris collaborated with friends at Harvard's computing department to create and unleash the worm. The worm took advantage of weaknesses in certain systems, including a flaw in the Unix SendMail program's debug mode, a hole in the finger network service due to buffer overflow, and the trust established by people setting up network logins with no password requirements via remote execution with remote shell. The worm also exploited weak passwords. Morris's techniques became less effective over time because of changes like disabling remote shell, fixing send mail and finger, using network filtering, and better awareness of weak passwords. Even though Morris claimed he didn't mean for the worm to be destructive, his coding made it more damaging than planned. Originally, the worm was supposed to check each computer for existing infections, but Morris thought system administrators might fake a clean report so he programmed the worm to copy itself 14% of the time, regardless of infection status. This led to multiple infections on a computer, slowing it down and causing crashes, similar to a fork bomb. However, the main part of the worm could infect only DEC VAX machines running 4BSD and Sun3 systems. There was also a portable C grappling hook part of the worm used to download the main parts. This grappling hook could run on other systems, causing them to slow down and become victims too. In the end, the effects of the worm surprised even the creator. Following the public revelation of the incident, the FBI swiftly identified the individual responsible. Robert Morris faced prosecution under the recently enacted Computer Fraud and Abuse Act of 1986, criminalizing unauthorized access to protected computers. In 1989, Morris was formally indicted and a jury found him guilty the subsequent year, marking the inaugural conviction under the newly established law. Recognizing Morris's lack of malicious intent and his remorseful demeanor, the judicial system opted for leniency. He was charged with a single felony count, receiving a sentence of three years of probation, 400 hours of community service, and a $10,000 fine. In the aftermath, Morris chose to remain silent, refraining from engaging with the media or seeking notoriety. Despite the incident, Morris picked his life back up and became even more successful. He continued his involvement with the internet, obtaining a doctorate from Harvard in 1999, amassing wealth as a dot-com millionaire, and eventually securing a tenured professorship at MIT. While the personal impact of Morris may have been relatively minor, the incident wielded profound implications for the internet's future. The Morris Worm served as a pivotal lesson for a burgeoning community underscoring the critical importance of taking cybersecurity seriously in a realm just beginning to comprehend its vulnerabilities. In response to the Morris Worm's infiltration, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, established a Computer Emergency Response Team, or CERT, to address potential future incidents. Moreover, the Worm served as a catalyst, revealing to a new generation of hackers the possibilities within their reach and inspiring subsequent attacks that persist to this day. Today, the Morris Worm stands as a curious relic from a less complex digital era, devoid of destructive consequences. Nevertheless, it resonates as a clarion call, signaling the end of the internet's small town innocence. The source code for the Morris Worm is now accessible online, and the original floppy disk finds a place of honor in Silicon Valley's Computer History Museum. Reflecting on its impact, the New York Times noted, the rogue program did not launch missiles, disrupt the stock market, or shut down the telephone network. But it did scare the wits out of a lot of people who run computer systems. And if you enjoyed this video, please hit the subscribe button. The next story is even more intriguing.